Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 577. Darn it. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. I am well, except I thought I was going to record last night right after the Zoom, and then I started putting things together, and that took a while. So here I am after my walk Friday morning, and I found that one of my favorite pairs of knitted gloves has a snag. And I'm going to have to darn it. And it's been a while since I've darned anything. And for this one, I actually think I'm going to have to pull out the magnifying glass because it's super tiny yarn. And I may even have to go find my drop spindle with my kiviet. (laughs) Because this is really fine yarn that I'm darning. (sighs) So there's that. No updates on the child with the foot in a splint because... Nothing has changed since last night. Boy is asleep. And that's pretty much it. I've been working, as you know, I've been working more on watercolor. And I found this guy through YouTube, but he teaches online, certainly through the pandemic. But he he used to teach in person a lot where people would go out and do urban sketching tours with him. He's from Liverpool. He's very funny. His name is Ian Fennelly. I will put a link in the show notes to one of the YouTube videos of his. But his style is something that I like and I enjoy emulating it. It's definitely not my style. I don't think I have a style yet, which is kind of pathetic. You know, 54 years old. What's your style? I have no idea. It's whatever strikes my fancy at the time. But I did learn something from following his tutorials, and it is this. I am able to do more playful watercolors and sketches even if I know that I'm not going to use real colors, if I know that I'm not going to try and match the colors. I have a feeling that this is a larger metaphor for life. (laughs) I'm not entirely sure where it goes yet, but I thought I would share that with you because I'm sure you will have insights that I don't write yet. But it is It is a curiosity. It is interesting. It kind of gives my brain permission to go off and do other things. I also really, really like his attitude towards sketching. He does a a thing where he uses the lightest gray Tombow brush marker, which many of you are probably familiar with. And he uses them because they're not entirely water soluble, but they are mostly water soluble. And so if you do a really quick sketchy sketch just to get the, the layout, the outline, of where your structure will wind up being. And then you go over that a little bit more carefully once you've got a more free, a more dynamic structure set down. You can go over that with those micron pens, like Zentangle pens, with a little bit more caution and a little bit more care, getting in a couple more details. And then he has you go in with watercolor on top. And that's when just all bets are off. Everything breaks loose. He has a class where he does four pubs. And the first pub that he does in this pub crawl, this pub painting tour, is a tutor, actual tutor pub, which of course has the big, heavy, dark beams and the white, the whitewashed exterior with these big, heavy, painted black timbers. Instead of painting them black on the page, because that would be pretty stark, could be incredibly beautiful, but also kind of stark. And he's just not that kind of guy. He uses bright purple and Windsor blue, which is like ultramarine and fallow blue combined. It's it's a bright blue. He uses burnt sienna or quinacridone gold to give a kind of a golden tone to some. It's very interesting watching what happens if you paint the timbers in a Tudor structure with colors like that. And it doesn't change the fact that it winds up looking like a Tudor building. It's just a playful one. So 
I've been having fun with that lately. Ian Fennelly. And like I said, I will put a link to a video from um, the YouTube channel Following the White Rabbit. She's a, a French watercolorist who I just love. I love her attitude. I love her life. I love her spark. She sparks joy is what she does. And I found out about him through her. So I will send you to her video if you want to see somebody do some really interesting things on a street in front of God and everybody on the fly doing urban sketching in a, a beautiful city. So the, the only other thing I had to share with you comes from Leanne from Oregon from the Thursday Night Zoom. She shared with me, following up on previous conversation, there is the line, the plural of anecdote is not data. She has a friend who told her that, yes, at her job, they call that anecdata. <laughs> People using anecdote to try and prove their point as though it were data, that is anecdata. So thank you, Leanne, for that. That made me very happy. So that is all the excitement I have for you. Nothing else has happened in the last 12 hours, except this. Hannah is dead. We don't know how, we don't know by whose hand, but I can tell you this much. I was going to do two chapters for you today. Chapter 30, Burnt Paper. Chapter 31, Thereby Hangs a Tale. And I got to the end of that chapter and said, gosh, it's Thanksgiving in the United States. I can't do this to you. It's, it's beyond cliffhanger. It would just be cruel for me to have stopped with chapter 31. So this is a very long episode because chapter 32 is very long. And you will see why when you get there. I'm not going to tell you what the chapter name is because that would give too much away. So chapter 30, 31, and long 32 coming at you right now. All right, here we go with Anna Catherine Green's The Leavenworth Case, chapters 30, 31, and 32. Read for us by Kevin Green. Here we go. Chapter 30. Burned Paper I could have better spared a better man. Henry IV I do not think I called immediately for help. The awful shock of this discovery, coming as it did at the very moment life and hope were strongest within me, the sudden downfall which it brought of all the plans based upon this woman's expected testimony, and worst of all, the dread coincidence between this sudden death and the exigency in which the guilty party, whoever it was, was supposed to be at that hour, was much too appalling for instant action. I could only stand and stare at the quiet face before me, smiling in its peaceful rest as if death were pleasanter than we think, and marvel over the providence which had brought us renewed fear instead of relief, complication instead of enlightenment, disappointment instead of realisation. For eloquent as is death, even on the faces of those unknown and unloved by us, the causes and consequences of this one were much too important to allow the mind to dwell upon the pathos of the scene itself. Hannah the girl was lost in Hannah the witness. But gradually as I gazed, the look of expectation which I perceived hovering about the wistful mouth and half-open lids attracted me, and I bent above her with a more personal interest, asking myself if she were quite dead, and whether or not immediate medical assistance would be of any avail. But the more closely I looked, the more certain I became that she had been dead for some hours, and the dismay occasioned by this thought, taken with the regrets which I must ever feel that I had not adopted the bold course the evening before, and by forcing my way to the hiding-place of this poor creature, interrupted, if not prevented, the consummation of her fate, startled me into a realisation of my present situation, and leaving her side, I went into the next room, threw up the window, and fastened to the blind the red handkerchief which I had taken the precaution to bring with me. Instantly a young man, whom I was fain to believe Q, though he bore not the least resemblance either in dress or facial expression to any renderings of that youth which I had yet seen, emerged from the tinsmith's house, and approached the one I was in. Observing him cast a hurried glance in my direction, 
I crossed the floor, and stood awaiting him at the head of the stairs. "'Well,' he whispered upon entering the house, and meeting my glance from below, "'have you seen her?' "'Yes,' I returned bitterly. "'I have seen her.' He hurriedly mounted to my side. "'And has she confessed?' "'No, I have had no talk with her.' Then, as I perceived him growing alarmed at my voice and manner, I drew him into Mrs. Belden's room, and hastily inquired, "'What did you mean this morning, when you informed me you had seen this girl, that she was in a certain room where I might find her?' "'What I said.' "'You have then been to her room?' "'No, I have only been on the outside of it. Seeing a light, I crawled up on to the ledge of the slanting roof last night, while both you and Mrs. Belden were out, and, looking through the window, saw her moving round the room. He must have observed my countenance change, for he stopped. "'What is to pay?' he cried. I could restrain myself no longer. "'Come,' I said, "'and see for yourself.' And leading him to the little room I had just left, I pointed to the silent form lying within. "'You told me I should find Hannah here, but you did not tell me I should find her in this condition. "'Great heaven!' he cried with a start. "'Not dead?' "'Yes,' I said. "'Dead.' It seemed as if he could not realise it. "'But it is impossible,' he returned. "'She is in heavy sleep, has taken a narcotic.' "'It is not sleep,' I said. "'Or if it is, she will never wake. Look!' And taking the hand once more in mine, I let it fall in its stone weight upon the bed. The sight seemed to convince him. Calming down, he stood gazing at her, with a very strange expression upon his face. Suddenly he moved, and began quietly turning over the clothes that were lying on the floor. "'What are you doing?' I asked. "'What are you looking for?' "'I am looking for the bit of paper from which I saw her take what I supposed to be a dose of medicine last night. "'Ah, here it is!' he cried, lifting a morsel of paper that, lying on the floor under the edge of the bed, had hitherto escaped his notice. "'Let me see!' I anxiously exclaimed. He handed me the paper, on the inner surface of which I could dimly discern the traces of an impalpable white powder. "'This is important,' I declared, carefully folding the paper together. "'If there is enough of this powder remaining to show that the contents of this paper were poisonous, the manner and means of the girl's death are accounted for, and a case of deliberate suicide made evident.' "'I am not so sure of that,' he retorted. "'If I am any judge of countenances, and I rather flatter myself I am, this girl had no more idea she was taking poison than I had. She looked not only bright but gay, and when she tipped up the paper, a smile of almost silly triumph crossed her face. If Mrs. Belden gave her that dose to take, telling her it was medicine—' "'That is something which yet remains to be learned. Also whether the dose, as you call it, was poisonous or not. It may be she died of heart disease.' He simply shrugged his shoulders, and pointed first at the plate of breakfast left on the chair, and secondly at the broken-down door. "'Yes,' I said, answering his look. "'Mrs. Belden has been in here this morning, and Mrs. Belden locked the door when she went out. But that proves nothing beyond her belief in the girl's hearty condition.' "'A belief which that white face on its tumbled pillow did not seem to shake.' Perhaps in her haste she may not have looked at the girl, but have set the dishes down without more than a casual glance in her direction? I don't want to suspect anything wrong, but it is such a coincidence. This was touching me on a sore point, and I stepped back. Well, said I, there is no use in our standing here busying ourselves with conjectures. There is too much to be done. Come. And I moved hurriedly towards the door. What are you going to do? he asked. "'Have you forgotten this is but an episode in the one great mystery we are sent here to unravel? "'If this girl has come to her death by some foul play, it is our business to find it out.' "'That must be left for the coroner. It has now passed out of our hands.' "'I know, but we can at least take full note of the room and everything in it, before throwing the affair into the hands of strangers. Mr. Grice will expect that much of us, I am sure.' "'I have looked at the room.' The whole is photographed on my mind. I am only afraid I could never forget it. And the body? Have you noticed its position? The lay of the bedclothes around it? The lack there is of all signs of struggle or fear? The repose of the countenance? 
the easy fall of the hands yes yes don't make me look at it any more then the clothes hanging on the wall rapidly pointing out each object as he spoke do you see a calico dress a shawl not the one in which she was believed to have run away but an old black one probably belonging to mrs belden then this chest opening it containing a few underclothes marked let us see ah with the name of the lady of the house but smaller than any she ever wore made for hannah you observe and marked with her own name to prevent suspicion and then these other clothes lying on the floor all new all marked in the same way and then this hello look here he suddenly cried going over to where he stood i stooped down when a wash-bowl half full of burned paper met my eye i saw her bending over something in this corner and could not think what it was can it be she is a suicide after all she has evidently destroyed something here which she didn't wish any one to see i do not know i said i could almost hope so not a scrap not a morsel left to show what it was how unfortunate mrs belden must solve this riddle i cried mrs belden must solve the whole riddle he replied the secret of the leavenworth murder hangs upon it then with a lingering look towards the mass of burned paper who knows but what that was a confession the conjecture seemed only too probable whatever it was said i it is now ashes and we have got to accept the fact and make the best of it yes he said with a deep sigh that's so but mr gryce will never forgive me for it never he will say i ought to have known it was a suspicious circumstance for her to take a dose of medicine at the very moment detection stood at her back but she did not know that she did not see you we don't know what she saw nor what mrs belden saw women are a mystery and though i flatter myself that ordinarily i am a match for the keenest bit of female flesh that ever walked i must say that in this case i feel myself thoroughly and shamefully worsted well well i said the end has not come yet who knows what a talk with mrs belden will bring out and by the way she will be coming back soon and i must be ready to meet her everything depends upon finding out if i can whether she is aware of this tragedy or not it is just possible she knows nothing about it and hurrying him from the room i pulled the door to behind me and led the way downstairs now said i there is one thing you must attend to at once a telegram must be sent to mr gryce acquainting him with this unlooked-for occurrence all right sir and q started for the door wait one moment said i i may not have another opportunity to mention it mrs belden received two letters from the postmaster yesterday one in a large and one in a small envelope if you could find out where they were postmarked q put his hand in his pocket i think i will not have to go too far to find out where one of them came from oh good george i have lost it and before i knew it he had returned upstairs that moment i heard the gate click End of chapter thirty chapter thirty one thereby hangs a tale taming of the shrew it was all a hoax nobody was ill i have been imposed upon meanly imposed upon and mrs belden flushed and panting entered the room where i was and proceeded to take off her bonnet but whilst doing so paused and suddenly exclaimed what is the matter how you look at me has anything happened something very serious has occurred i replied you have been gone but a little while but in that time a discovery has been made i purposely paused here that the suspense might elicit from her some betrayal but though she turned pale she manifested less emotion than i expected and i went on which is likely to produce very important consequences to my surprise she burst violently into tears i knew it i knew it she murmured i always said it would be impossible to keep it secret if i let anybody into the house she is so restless but i, I forget she suddenly said with a frightened look you haven't told me what the discovery was perhaps it isn't what i thought perhaps i did not hesitate to interrupt her mrs belden i said i shall not try to mitigate the blow 
a woman who in the face of the most urgent call from law and justice can receive into her house and harbour there a witness of such importance as hannah cannot stand in need of any great preparation for hearing that her efforts have been too successful that she has accomplished her design of suppressing valuable testimony that law and justice are outraged and that the innocent woman whom this girl's evidence might have saved stands for ever compromised in the eyes of the world if not in those of the officers of the law her eyes which had never left me during this address flashed wide with dismay what do you mean she cried i have intended no wrong i have only tried to save people i but, but who are you what have you got to do with all this what is it to you what i do or don't do you said you were a lawyer can it be you are come from mary leavenworth to see how i am fulfilling her commands and mrs belden i said it is of small importance now as to who i am or for what purpose i am here but that my words may have the more effect i will say that whereas i have not deceived you either as to my name or position it is true that i am the friend of the misses leavenworth and that anything which is likely to affect them is of interest to me when therefore i say that eleanor leavenworth is irretrievably injured by this girl's death death what do you mean death the burst was too natural the tone too horror-stricken for me to doubt for another moment as to this woman's ignorance of the true state of affairs yes i repeated the girl you have been hiding so long and so well is now beyond your control only her dead body remains mrs belden i shall never lose from my ears the shriek which she uttered nor the wild i don't believe it i don't believe it with which she dashed from the room and rushed upstairs nor that after scene when in the presence of the dead she stood wringing her hands and protesting amid sobs of the sincerest grief and terror that she knew nothing of it that she had left the girl in the best of spirits the night before that it was true she had locked her in but this she always did when any one was in the house and that if she died of any sudden attack it must have been quietly for she had heard no stir all night though she had listened more than once being naturally anxious lest the girl should make some disturbance that would arouse me but you were in here this morning said i yes but i didn't notice i was in a hurry and thought she was asleep so i set the things down where she could get them and came right away locking the door as usual it is strange she should have died this night of all others was she ill yesterday no sir she was even brighter than common more lively i never thought of her being sick then or ever if i had uh... you never thought of her being sick a voice interrupted why then did you take such pains to give her a dose of medicine last night and q entered from the room beyond i didn't she protested evidently under the supposition it was i who had spoken did i hannah did i poor girl stroking the hand that lay in hers with what appeared to be genuine sorrow and regret how came she by it then where did she get it if you didn't give it to her this time she seemed to be aware that some one besides myself was talking to her for hurriedly rising she looked at the man with a wondering stare before replying i don't know who you are sir but i can tell you this the girl had no medicine took no dose she wasn't sick last night that i know of yet i saw her swallow a powder saw her the world is crazy or i am you saw her swallow a powder how could you see her do that or anything else hasn't she been shut up in this room for twenty-four hours yes but with a window like that in the roof it isn't so very difficult to see into the room madam oh she cried shrinking i have a spy in the house have i but i deserve it I kept her imprisoned in four close walls, and never came to look at her once all night. I don't complain. But what was it you say you saw her take? Medicine? Poison? I didn't say poison. But you meant it. You think she has poisoned herself, and that I had a hand in it? No, I hastened to remark. He does not think you had a hand in it. He says he saw the girl herself swallow something which he believes to have been the occasion of her death, and only asks you now where she obtained it. 
"'How can I tell? I never gave her anything. Didn't know she had anything.' Somehow I believed her, and so felt unwilling to prolong the present interview, especially as each moment delayed the action which I felt it incumbent upon us to take. So, motioning Q to depart upon his errand, I took Mrs. Belden by the hand, and endeavoured to lead her from the room. But she resisted, sitting down by the side of the bed with the expression, "'I will not leave her again. Do not ask it. Here is my place, and here I will stay.' While Q, obdurate for the first time, stood, staring severely upon us both, and would not move, though I urged him again to make haste, saying that the morning was slipping away, and that the telegram to Mr. Grice ought to be sent. "'Till that woman leaves the room, I don't, and unless you promise to take my place in watching her, I don't quit the house.' Astonished, I left her side and crossed to him. "'You carry your suspicions too far,' I whispered, "'and I think you are too rude. We have seen nothing, I am sure, to warrant us in any such action. Besides, she can do no harm here. Though, as for watching her, I promise to do that much if it will relieve your mind. I don't want her watched here. Take her below.' I cannot leave while she remains. Are you not assuming a trifle the master? Perhaps I don't know. If I am, it is because I have something in my possession which excuses my conduct. What is that, the letter? Yes. Agitated now, in my turn, I held out my hand. Let me see, I said. Not while that woman remains in the room. Seeing him implacable, I returned to Mrs. Belden. "'I must entreat you to come with me,' said I. "'This is not a common death. "'We shall be obliged to have the coroner here and others. "'You had better leave the room and go below.' "'I don't mind the coroner. "'He is a neighbour of mine. "'His coming won't prevent my watching over the poor girl until he arrives.' "'Mrs. Belden,' I said, "'your position as the only one conscious of the presence of this girl in your house makes it wiser for you not to invite suspicion by lingering any longer than is necessary in the room where her dead body lies. "'As if my neglect of her now were the best surety of my good intentions towards her in time past!' "'It will not be neglect for you to go below with me at my earnest request. You can do no good here by staying. Will, in fact, be doing harm. So listen to me, or I shall be obliged to leave you in charge of this man and go myself to inform the authorities. This last argument seemed to affect her, for, with one look of shuddering abhorrence at Q, she rose, saying, You have me in your power, and then, without another word, threw her handkerchief over the girl's face and left the room. In two minutes more I had the letter of which Q had spoken in my hands. "'It is the only one I could find, sir. "'It was in the pocket of the dress Mrs. Belden had on last night. "'The other must be lying around somewhere, but I haven't had time to find it. "'This will do, though, I think. "'You will not ask for the other.' "'Scarcely noticing at the time with what deep significance he spoke, "'I opened the letter. "'It was the smaller of the two I had seen her draw under her shawl "'the day before at the post-office, and read as follows. "'Dear, dear friend, I am in awful trouble.' You who love me must know it. I cannot explain. I can only make one prayer. Destroy what you have, to-day, instantly, without question or hesitation. The consent of any one else has nothing to do with it. You must obey. I am lost if you refuse. Do then what I ask, and save. One who loves you. It was addressed to Mrs. Belden. There was no signature or date, only the postmark, New York. But I knew the handwriting— it was Mary Leavenworth's. "'A damning letter,' came in the dry tones which Q seemed to think fit to adopt on this occasion, "'and a damning bit of evidence against the one who wrote it, and the woman who received it.' "'A terrible piece of evidence indeed,' said I. "'If I did not happen to know that this letter refers to the destruction of something radically different from what you suspect. It alludes to some papers in Mrs. Belden's charge, nothing else.' "'Are you sure, sir?' quite, but we will talk of this hereafter. It is time you sent your telegram, and went for the coroner. Very well, sir. And with this we parted, he to perform his role, and I mine. I found Mrs. Belden walking the floor below, bewailing her situation, and uttering wild sentences as to what the neighbours would say of her, 
what the minister would think, what Clara, whoever that was, would do, and how she wished she had died before ever she had meddled with the affair. Succeeding in calming her after a while, I induced her to sit down and listen to what I had to say. "'You will only injure yourself by this display of feeling,' I remarked, "'besides unfitting yourself for what you will presently be called upon to go through.' and, laying myself out to comfort the unhappy woman, I first explained the necessities of the case, and next inquired if she had no friend upon whom she could call in this emergency. To my great surprise she replied no, that while she had kind neighbours and good friends, there was no one upon whom she could call in a case like this, either for assistance or sympathy, and that unless I would take pity on her she would have to meet it alone. "'As I have met everything,' she said, "'from Mr. Belden's death "'to the loss of most of my little savings "'in a town fire last year.' "'I was touched by this, "'that she, who, in spite of her weakness "'and inconsistencies of character, "'possessed at least the one virtue of sympathy "'with her kind, should feel any lack of friends. "'Unhesitatingly I offered to do what I could for her, "'providing she would treat me with the perfect frankness "'which the case demanded.' To my great relief she expressed not only her willingness but her strong desire to tell all she knew. "'I have had enough secrecy for my whole life,' she said, and indeed I do believe she was so thoroughly frightened that if a police officer had come to the house and asked her to reveal secrets compromising the good name of her own son she would have done so without cavil or question. "'I feel as if I wanted to take my stand out on the common and in the face of the whole world declare what I have done for Mary Leavenworth. But first, she whispered, tell me, for God's sake, how those girls are situated. I have not dared to ask or write. The papers say a good deal about Eleanor, but nothing about Mary, and yet Mary writes of her own peril only, and of the danger she would be in if certain facts were known. What is the truth? I don't want to injure them, only to take care of myself. "'Mrs. Belden,' I said, "'Eleanor Leavenworth has got into her present difficulty "'by not telling all that was required of her. "'Mary Leavenworth, but I cannot speak of her "'till I know what you have to divulge. "'Her position, as well as that of her cousin, "'is too anomalous for either you or me to discuss. "'What we want to learn from you is "'how you became connected with this affair, "'and what it was that Hannah knew, "'which caused her to leave New York and take refuge here.' But Mrs. Belden, clasping and unclasping her hands, met my gaze with one full of the most apprehensive doubt. "'You will never believe me,' she cried. "'But I don't know what Hannah knew. I am in utter ignorance of what she saw or heard on that fatal night. She never told, and I never asked. She merely said that Miss Leavenworth wished me to secrete her for a short time, and I, because I loved Mary Leavenworth and admired her beyond any one I ever saw, weakly consented, and—' "'Do you mean to say,' I interrupted, "'that after you knew of the murder, you, at the mere expression of Miss Leavenworth's wishes, continued to keep this girl concealed without asking her any questions or demanding any explanations?' "'Yes, sir. You will never believe me, but it is so. I thought that, since Mary had sent her here, she must have her reasons, and—and—' I cannot explain it now, it all looks so differently, but I did do as I have said. But that was a very strange conduct. You must have had strong reason for obeying Mary Leavenworth so blindly. Oh, sir, she gasped, I thought I understood it all, that Mary, the bright young creature who had stooped from her lofty position to make use of me and to love me, was in some way linked to the criminal and that it would be better for me to remain in ignorance, do as I was bid, and trust all would come right. I did not reason about it. I only followed my impulse. I couldn't do otherwise. It isn't my nature. When I am requested to do anything for a person I love, I cannot refuse. And you love Mary Leavenworth, a woman whom you yourself seem to consider capable of a great crime? Oh, I didn't say that. I don't know as I thought that. She might be in some way connected with it, without being the actual perpetrator. She could never be that. She is too dainty. Mrs. Belden, I said, what do you know of Mary Leavenworth? 
which makes even that supposition possible. The white face of the woman before me flushed. "'I scarcely know what to reply,' she cried. "'It is a long story, and—' "'Never mind the long story,' I interrupted. "'Let me hear the one vital reason.' "'Well,' said she, "'it is this, that Mary was in an emergency from which nothing but her uncle's death could release her.' "'Ah, how's that?' But here we were interrupted by the sound of steps on the porch, and, looking out, I saw Q entering the house alone. Leaving Mrs. Belden where she was, I stepped into the hall. "'Well,' said I, "'what is the matter? Haven't you found the coroner? Isn't he at home?' "'No. Gone away, off in a buggy, to look after a man that was found some ten miles from here, lying in a ditch beside a yoke of oxen.' Then, as he saw my look of relief, for I was glad of this temporary delay, said with an expressive wink, "'It would take a fellow a long time to go to him, if he wasn't in a hurry. Hours, I think.' "'Indeed,' I returned, amused at his manner. "'Rough road?' "'Very. No horse I could get could travel it faster than a walk.' "'Well,' said I, "'so much the better for us. Mrs. Belden has a long story to tell, and doesn't wish to be interrupted. I understand.' I nodded, and he turned towards the door. "'Have you telegraphed Mr. Grice?' I asked. "'Yes, sir.' "'Do you think he will come?' "'Yes, sir, if he has to hobble on two sticks.' "'At what time do you look for him?' "'You will look for him as early as three o'clock. I shall be among the mountains, ruefully eyeing my broken-down team.' And, leisurely donning his hat, he strolled away down the street like one who has the whole day on his hands and does not know what to do with it. An opportunity being thus given for Mrs. Belden's story, she at once composed herself to the task with the following result. End of chapter 31 Chapter 32 Mrs. Belden's Narrative Cursed, destructive avarice, thou everlasting foe to love and honour, traps Atram. Mischief never thrives without the help of woman, the same. It will be a year next July since I first saw Mary Leavenworth. I was living at that time a most monotonous existence, loving what was beautiful, hating what was sordid, drawn by nature towards all that was romantic and uncommon, but doomed by my straitened position and the loneliness of my widowhood to spend my days in the weary round of plain sewing, I had begun to think that the shadow of a humdrum old age was settling down upon me, when one morning, in the full tide of my dissatisfaction, Mary Leavenworth stepped across the threshold of my door, and with one smile changed the whole tenor of my life. This may seem exaggeration to you, especially when I say that her errand was simply one of business, she having heard I was handy with my needle, but if you could have seen her as she appeared that day, marked the look with which she approached me, and the smile with which she left, you would pardon the folly of a romantic old woman who beheld a fairy queen in this lovely young lady. The fact is I was dazzled by her beauty and her charms and when a few days after she came again and crouching down on the stool at my feet said she was so tired of the gossip and tumult down at the hotel that it was a relief to run away and hide with someone who would let her act like the child she was i experienced for the moment i believed the truest happiness of my life meeting her advances with all the warmth her manner invited i found her ere long listening eagerly while i told her almost without my own volition, the story of my past life in the form of an amusing allegory. The next day saw her in the same place, and the next, always with the eager, laughing eyes and the fluttering, uneasy hands that grasped everything they touched and broke everything they grasped. But the fourth day she was not there, nor the fifth, nor the sixth, and I was beginning to feel the old shadow settling back upon me, when one night, just as the dusk of twilight was merging into the evening gloom, she came stealing in at the front door, and, creeping up to my side, put her hands over my eyes, with such a low, ringing laugh that I started. 
"'You don't know what to make of me,' she cried, throwing aside her cloak, and revealing herself in the full splendour of evening attire. "'I don't know what to make of myself. Though it seems folly, I felt that I must run away and tell someone that a certain pair of eyes have been looking into mine, and that for the first time in my life I feel myself a woman as well as a queen, and with a glance in which coyness struggled with pride, she gathered up her cloak around her, and laughingly cried, "'Have you had a visit from a flying sprite? Has one little ray of moonlight found its way into your prison for a wee moment, with Mary's laugh and Mary's snowy silk and flashing diamonds? Say!' And she patted my cheek, and smiled so bewilderingly, that even now, with all the dull horror of these after-events crowding upon me, I cannot but feel something like tears spring to my eyes at the thought of it. "'And so the Prince has come for you,' I whispered, alluding to a story I had told her the last time she had visited me, a story in which a girl who had waited all her life in rags and degradation for the lordly knight who was to raise her from a hovel to a throne, died just as her one lover, an honest peasant lad, whom she had discarded in her pride, arrived at her door with the fortune he had spent all his days in amassing for her sake. But at this she flushed, and drew back towards the door. "'I don't know. I'm afraid not. I, I don't think anything about that. Princes are not so easily won,' she murmured. "'What are you going?' I said. "'And alone? Let me accompany you.' But she only shook her fairy head, and replied, "'No, no, that would be spoiling the romance, indeed. I have come upon you like a sprite, and like a sprite I will go.' And flashing, like the moonbeam she was, she glided out into the night and floated away down the street. When she next came, I observed a feverish excitement in her manner, which assured me, even plainer than the coy sweetness displayed in our last interview, that her heart had been touched by her lover's attentions. Indeed, she hinted as much before she left, saying in a melancholy tone, when I had ended my story in the usual happy way, with kisses and marriage, I shall never marry finishing the exclamation with a long-drawn sigh that somehow emboldened me to say, perhaps because I knew she had no mother, and why? What reason can there be for such rosy lips, saying their possessor will never marry? She gave me one quick look, and then dropped her eyes. I feared I had offended her, and was feeling very humble, when she suddenly replied in an even but low tone, I said I should never marry, because the one man who pleases me can never be my husband. All the hidden romance in my nature started at once into life. Why not? What do you mean? Tell me. There is nothing to tell, said she. Only I have been so weak as to, she would not say, fall in love, she was a proud woman, admire a man whom my uncle will never allow me to marry and she rose as if to go, but I drew her back. "'Whom your uncle will not allow you to marry?' I repeated. "'Why? Because he is poor?' "'No. Uncle loves money, but not to such an extent as that. Besides, Mr. Clavering is not poor. He is the owner of a beautiful place in his own country.' "'Own country?' I interrupted. "'Is he not an American?' No, she returned, he is an Englishman. I did not see why she need say that in just the way she did, but, supposing she was aggravated by some secret memory, went on to inquire, then what difficulty can there be? Isn't he, I was going to say steady, but refrained. He is an Englishman, she emphasised, in the same bitter tone as before. In saying that, I say it all. "'Uncle will never let me marry an Englishman.' I looked at her in amazement. Such a puerile reason as this had never entered my mind. "'He has an absolute mania on the subject,' resumed she. "'I might as well ask him to allow me to drown myself as to marry an Englishman.' A woman of truer judgment than myself would have said, "'Then, if that is so, why not discard from your breast all thought of him? Why dance with him and talk to him?' and let your admiration develop into love. But I was all romance then, and angry at a prejudice I could neither understand nor appreciate, I said, But that is mere tyranny. 
why should he hate the English so? And why, if he does, should you feel yourself obliged to gratify him in a whim so unreasonable? Why? Shall I tell you, Auntie? she said, flushing and looking away. Yes, I returned. Tell me everything. Well, then, if you want to know the worst of me, as you already know the best, I hate to incur my uncle's displeasure, because— because— I have always been brought up to regard myself as his heiress, and I know that if I were to marry contrary to his wishes, he would instantly change his mind and leave me penniless. But I cried, my romance a little dampened by this admission, you tell me Mr. Clavering has enough to live upon, so you would not want, and if you love— Her violet eyes fairly flashed in her amazement. You don't understand, she said. Mr. Clavering is not poor, but uncle is rich. I shall be a queen. There she paused, trembling, and falling on my breast. Oh, it sounds mercenary, I know, but it is the fault of my bringing up. I have been taught to worship money. I would be utterly lost without it, and yet, her whole face softening with the light of another emotion, I cannot say to Henry Clavering, Go, my prospects are dearer to me than you. I cannot, oh, I cannot. You love him, then, said I, determined to get at the truth of the matter if possible. She rose restlessly. Isn't that a proof of love? If you knew me, you would say it was. And turning, she took her stand before a picture that hung on the wall of my sitting-room. That looks like me, she said. It was one of a pair of good photographs I possessed. Yes, I remarked, that is why I prize it. She did not seem to hear me. She was absorbed at gazing at the exquisite face before her. That is a winning face, I heard her say, sweeter than mine. I wonder if she would ever hesitate between love and money. I do not believe she would. Her own countenance growing gloomy and sad as she said so. She would think only of the happiness she would confer. She is not hard like me. Eleanor herself would love this girl. I think she had forgotten my presence, for at the mention of her cousin's name she turned quickly round with a half-suspicious look, saying lightly, My dear old Mamma Hubbard looks horrified. She did not know she had such a very unromantic little wretch for a listener, when she was telling all those wonderful stories of love slaying dragons and living in caves and walking over burning ploughshares as if they were tufts of spring grass. No, I said, taking her with an irresistible impulse of admiring affection into my arms. But if I had, it would have made no difference. I should still have talked about love, and of all it can do to make this weary workaday world sweet and delightful. Would you? Then you do not think me such a wretch? What could I say? I thought of the winsomest being in the world, and frankly told her so. Instantly she brightened into her very gayest self. Not that I thought then, much less do I think now, she partially cared for my good opinion, but her nature demanded admiration, and unconsciously blossomed under it, as a flower under the sunshine. And will you still let me come and tell you how bad I am? That is, if I go on being bad, as I doubtless shall to the end of the chapter. You will not turn me off? I will never turn you off. Not if I should do a dreadful thing. Not if I should run away with my lover some fine night and leave uncle to discover how his affectionate partiality has been requited. It was lightly said and lightly meant, for she did not even wait for my reply. But its seed sank deep into our two hearts for all that, and for the next few days I spent my time in planning how I should manage, if it should ever fall to my lot to conduct to a successful issue so enthralling a piece of business as an elopement. You may imagine, then, how delighted I was when one evening Hannah, this unhappy girl, who is now lying dead under my roof, and who was occupying the position of lady's maid to Miss Mary Leavenworth at that time, came to my door with a note from her mistress, running thus, "'Have the loveliest story of the season ready for me to-morrow, and let the prince be as handsome as as some one you have heard of, and the princess as foolish as your little yielding pet, 
Mary. Which short note could only mean that she was engaged. But the next day did not bring me Mary, nor the next, nor the next. And beyond hearing that Mr. Leavenworth had returned from his trip, I received neither word nor token. Two more days dragged by. When just as twilight set in, she came. It had been a week since I had seen her, but it might have been a year from the change I observed in her countenance and expression. I could scarcely greet her with any show of pleasure. She was so unlike her former self. "'You are disappointed, are you not?' said she, looking at me. "'You expected revelations, whispered hopes, and all manner of sweet confidences. And you see instead a cold, bitter woman, who for the first time in your presence feels inclined to be reserved and uncommunicative. "'That is because you have had more to trouble than encourage you in your love,' I returned, though not without a certain shrinking caused more by her manner than words. She did not reply to this, but rose and paced the floor, coldly at first, but afterwards with a certain degree of excitement that proved to be the prelude to a change in her manner, for suddenly pausing she turned to me and said, "'Mr. Clavering has left R, Mrs. Belden.' left yes my uncle commanded me to dismiss him and i obeyed the work dropped from my hands in my heartfelt disappointment ah oh, then he knows of your engagement to mr clavering yes he had not been in the house five minutes before eleanor told him then she knew yes with a half sigh she could hardly help it. I was foolish enough to give her the cue in my first moment of joy and weakness. I did not think of the consequences, but I might have known. She is so conscientious. I do not call it conscientiousness to tell another's secrets, I returned. That is because you are not Eleanor. Not having a reply for this, I said, And so your uncle did not regard your engagement with favour? Favour? Did I not tell you he would never allow me to marry an Englishman? He said he would sooner see me buried. And you yielded, made no struggle. Let the hard, cruel man have his way. She was walking off to look again at that picture which had attracted her attention the time before, but at this word gave me one little sidelong look that was inexpressibly suggestive. I obeyed him when he commanded, if that is what you mean and dismissed Mr. Clavering after having given him your word of honour to be his wife. Why not, when I found I could not keep my word? Then you have decided not to marry him. She did not reply at once, but lifted her face mechanically to the picture. My uncle would tell you that I had decided to be governed wholly by his wishes, she responded at last with what I felt was self-scornful bitterness. Greatly disappointed, I burst into tears. "'Oh, Mary!' I cried. "'Oh, Mary!' and instantly blushed, startled that I had called her by her first name. But she did not appear to notice. "'Have you any complaint to make?' she asked. "'Is it not my manifest duty to be governed by my uncle's wishes? Has he not brought me up from childhood, lavished every luxury upon me, made me all I am even to the love of riches which he has instilled into my soul, with every gift he has thrown into my lap, every word he has dropped into my ear, since I was old enough to know what riches meant? Is it for me to now turn my back upon fostering care so wise, beneficent and free, just because a man whom I have known some two weeks chances to offer me in exchange what he pleases to call his love? But, I feebly essayed, convinced perhaps by the tone of sarcasm in which this was uttered that she was not far from my way of thinking after all, if in two weeks you have learned to love this man more than everything else, even the riches which make your uncle's favour a thing of such moment, well, said she, what then? Why, then I would say, secure your happiness with a man of your choice, if you have to marry him in secret trusting to your influence over your uncle to win the forgiveness he never can persistently deny you should have seen the arch expression which stole across her face at that would it not be better she asked creeping to my arms and laying her head on my shoulder 
would it not be better for me to make sure of that uncle's favour first, before undertaking the hazardous experiment of running away with her too ardent lover? Struck by her manner, I lifted her face and looked at it. It was one amused smile. "'Oh, my darling,' said I, "'you have not then dismissed Mr. Clavering.' "'I have sent him away,' she whispered demurely. "'But not without hope.' She burst into a ringing laugh. "'Oh, you dear old Mamma Hubbard, what a matchmaker you are, to be sure! You appear as much interested as if you were the lover yourself.' "'But tell me,' I urged. In a moment her serious mood returned. "'He will wait for me,' said she. The next day I submitted to her the plan I had formed for the clandestine intercourse with Mr. Clavering. It was for them both to assume names, she taking mine, as one less liable to provoke conjecture than a strange name, and he that of Leroy Robbins. The plan pleased her, and with the slight modification of a secret sign being used on the envelope to distinguish her letters from mine was at once adopted. And so it was I took the fatal step that has involved me in all this trouble. With the gift of my name to this young girl, to use as she would, and sign what she would, I seemed to part with what was left me of judgment and discretion. Henceforth I was only her scheming, planning, devoted slave, now copying the letters which she brought me, and enclosing them to the false name we had agreed upon, and now busying myself in devising ways to forward to her those which I had received from him, without risk of discovery. Hannah was the medium we employed, as Mary felt it would not be wise for her to come too often to my house. To this girl's charge, then, I gave such notes as I could not forward in any other way, secure in the reticence of her nature, as well as in her inability to read, that these letters addressed to Mrs. Amy Belden would arrive at their proper destination without mishap, and I believe they always did. At all events, no difficulty that I ever heard of arose out of the use of this girl as a go-between. But a change was at hand. Mr. Clavering, who had left an invalid mother in England, was suddenly summoned home. He prepared to go, but, flushed with love, distracted by doubts, smitten with the fear that, once withdrawn from the neighbourhood of a woman so universally courted as Mary, he would stand small chance of retaining his position in her regard, he wrote to her, telling his fears and asking her to marry him before he went. "'Make me your husband, and I will follow your wishes in all things,' he wrote. "'The certainty that you are mine will make parting possible. Without it I cannot go. No, not if my mother should die without the comfort of saying good-bye to her only child. By some chance she was in my house when I brought this letter from the post-office, and I shall never forget how she started when she read it but from looking as if she had received an insult, she speedily settled down into a calm consideration of the subject, writing and delivering into my charge for copying a few lines, in which she promised to accede to his request, if he would agree to leave the public declaration of the marriage to her discretion, and consent to bid her farewell at the door of the church, or wherever the ceremony of marriage should take place, never to come into her presence again, till such declaration had been made. Of course this brought in a couple of days the sure response, anything, so you will be mine. And Amy Belden's wits and powers of planning were all summoned into requisition for the second time, to devise how this matter could be arranged without subjecting the parties to the chance of detection. I found the thing very difficult. In the first place it was essential that the marriage should come off within three days. Mr. Clavering, having upon the receipt of her letter, secured his passage upon a steamer that sailed on the following Saturday, and next, both he and Miss Leavenworth were too conspicuous in their personal appearance to make it at all possible for them to be secretly married anywhere within gossiping distance of this place, and yet it was desirable that the scene of the ceremony should not be too far away, or the time occupied in effecting the journey to and from the place would necessitate an absence from the hotel on the part of Miss Leavenworth long enough to arouse the suspicions of Eleanor, 
something which Mary felt it wiser to avoid. Her uncle, I had forgotten to say, was not here, having gone away again shortly after the apparent dismissal of Mr. Clavering. F, then, was the only town I could think of which combined the two advantages of distance and accessibility. Although upon the railroad it was an insignificant place, and had, what was better yet, a very obscure man for its clergyman, living, which was best of all, not ten rods from the depot. If they could meet there, making inquiries I found it could be done, and, all alive to the romance of the occasion, proceeded to plan the details. And now I am coming to what might have caused the overthrow of the whole scheme. I allude to the detection on the part of Eleanor of the correspondence between Mary and Mr. Clavering. It happened thus. Hannah, who in her frequent visits to my house had grown very fond of my society, had come in to sit with me for a while one evening. She had not been in the house, however, more than ten minutes before there came a knock at the front door, and going to it I saw Mary, as I supposed, from the long cloak she wore, standing before me. Thinking she had come with a letter for Mr. Clavering, I grasped her arm and drew her into the hall, saying, "'Have you got it? I must post it to-night, or he will not receive it in time.' There I paused, for the panting creature I had by the arm, turning upon me, I saw myself confronted by a stranger. "'You have made a mistake,' she cried. "'I am Eleanor Leavenworth, and I have come for my girl, Hannah. Is she here?' I could only raise my hand in apprehension, and point to the girl sitting in the corner of the room before her. Miss Leavenworth immediately turned back. "'Hannah, I want you,' said she. I would have left the house without another word, but I caught her by the arm. "'Oh, miss,' I began, but she gave me such a look. I dropped her arm. "'I have nothing to say to you,' she cried, in a low, thrilling voice. "'Do not detain me.' And with a glance to see if Hannah were following her, she went out. For an hour I sat crouched on the stair just where she had left me. Then I went to bed, but I did not sleep a wink that night. You can imagine, then, my wonder when, with the first glow of the early morning light, Mary, looking more beautiful than ever, came running up the steps and into the room where I was, with a letter for Mr. Clavering, trembling in her hand. Oh! I cried in my joy and relief. Didn't she understand me, then? The gay look on Mary's face turned to one of reckless scorn. "'If you mean Eleanor, yes. She is duly initiated, Mamma Hubbard, knows that I love Mr. Clavering and write to him. I couldn't keep it a secret after the mistake you made last evening. So I did the next best thing, told her the truth.' "'Not that you are about to be married?' "'Certainly not. I don't believe in unnecessary communications.' and you did not find her as angry as you expected. I will not say that she was angry enough, and yet, continued Mary, with a burst of self-scornful penitence, I will not call Eleanor's lofty indignation anger. She was grieved, Mamma Hubbard, grieved, and with a laugh which I believe was rather the result of her own relief than of any wish to reflect on her cousin, she threw her head on one side and eyed me with a look which seemed to say, "'Do I plague you so very much, you dear old Mamma Hubbard?' She did plague me, and I could not conceal it. "'And will she not tell her uncle?' I gasped. The naive expression on Mary's face quickly changed. "'No,' said she. I felt a heavy hand, hot with fever, lifted from my heart. "'And we can still go on?' She held out the letter for reply. The plan agreed upon between us for carrying out our intentions was this. At the time appointed, Mary was to excuse herself to her cousin upon the plea that she had promised to take me to see a friend in the next town. She was then to enter a buggy, previously ordered, and drive there, where I was to join her. We were then to proceed immediately to the minister's house in F, where we had reason to believe we should find everything prepared for us. But in this plan, simple as it was, one thing was forgotten, and that was the character of Eleanor's love for her cousin. That her suspicions would be aroused, we did not doubt, but that she would actually follow Mary up and demand an explanation of her conduct was what neither she, who knew her so well, nor I, who knew her so little, ever imagined possible, 
and yet that was just what occurred. But let me explain. Mary, who had followed out the programme to the point of leaving a little note of excuse on Eleanor's dressing-table, had come to my house, and was just taking off her long cloak to show me her dress, when there came a commanding knock at the front door. Hastily pulling a cloak about her, I ran to open it, intending you may be sure to dismiss my visitor with short ceremony, when I heard a voice behind me say, "'Good heavens, it is Eleanor!' and glancing back saw Mary looking through the window-blind upon the porch without. "'What shall we do?' I cried, in very natural dismay. "'Do? Why open the door and let her in? I am not afraid of Eleanor.' Immediately I did so, and Eleanor Leavenworth, very pale but with resolute countenance, walked into the house and into this room, confronting Mary in very nearly the same spot where you are now sitting. "'I have come,' said she, lifting a face whose expression of mingled sweetness and power I could not but admire, even in that moment of apprehension, to ask you, without any excuse for my request, if you will allow me to accompany you upon your drive this morning. Mary, who had drawn herself up to meet some word of accusation or appeal, turned carelessly away to the glass. I am very sorry, she said, but the buggy holds only two, and I shall be obliged to refuse. I will order a carriage. But I do not wish your company, Eleanor. We are off on a pleasure trip, and desire to have our fun by ourselves. And you will not allow me to accompany you? I cannot prevent you going in another carriage. Eleanor's face grew yet more earnest in its expression. Mary, said she, we have been brought up together. I am your sister in affection, if not in blood, and I cannot see you start upon this adventure with no other companion than this woman. Then tell me, shall I go with you as a sister, or on the road behind you as the enforced guardian of your honour against your will? My honour? You are going to meet Mr. Clavering. Well? Twenty miles from home. Well? Now is it discreet or honourable in you to do this? Mary's haughty lip took an ominous curve. The same hand that raised you has raised me, she cried bitterly. This is no time to speak of that, returned Eleanor. Mary's countenance flushed. All the antagonism of her nature was aroused. She looked absolutely Juno-like in her wrath and wrathless menace. Eleanor, she cried, I am going to F to marry Mr. Clavering. Now do you wish to accompany me? I do. Mary's whole manner changed. Leaping forward, she grasped her cousin's arm and shook it. For what reason? she cried. What do you intend to do? To witness the marriage, if it be a true one. To step between you and shame, if any element of falsehood should come in to affect its legality. Mary's hand fell from her cousin's arm. "'I do not understand you,' said she. "'I thought you never gave countenance to what you considered wrong. "'Nor do I. "'Any one who knows me will understand that I do not give my approval to this marriage "'just because I attend its ceremonial in the capacity of an unwilling witness. "'Then why go? "'Because I value your honour above my own peace, "'because I love our common benefactor.' and know that he would never pardon me if I let his darling be married, however contrary her union might be to his wishes, without lending the support of my presence to make the transaction at least a respectable one. But in doing so you will be involved in a world of deception which you hate. Any more so than now? Mr. Clavering does not return with me, Eleanor. No, I suppose not. I leave him immediately after the ceremony. Eleanor bowed her head. He goes to Europe. A pause. And I return home. There to wait for what, Mary? Mary's face crimsoned, and she turned slowly away. What every other girl does under such circumstances, I suppose. The development of more reasonable feelings in an obdurate parent's heart. Eleanor sighed, and a short silence ensued broken by Eleanor's suddenly falling upon her knees and clasping her cousin's hand. Oh, Mary, she sobbed, her haughtiness all disappearing in a gush of wild entreaty. Consider what you are doing. Think, before it is too late, the consequences which must follow such an act as this. Marriage founded upon deception can never lead to happiness. Love, but it is not that. Love would have led you either to have dismissed Mr. Clavering at once, or to have openly accepted the fate which her union with him would bring. 
only passion stoops to subterfuge like this and you she continued rising and turning towards me in a sort of forlorn hope very touching to see can you see this young motherless girl driven by caprice and acknowledging no moral restraint enter upon the dark and crooked path she is planning for herself without uttering one word of warning and appeal tell me mother of children dead and buried what excuse you will have for your own part in this day's work when she with her face marred by the sorrows which must follow this deception comes to you the same excuse probably mary's voice broke in chill and strained which you will have when uncle inquires how you came to allow such an act of disobedience to be perpetrated in his absence that she could not help herself that mary could gang her own gate and every one around must accommodate themselves to it it was like a draught of icy air suddenly poured into a room heated up to fever point eleanor stiffened immediately and drawing back pale and composed turned upon her cousin with the remark then nothing can move you the curling of mary's lips was her only reply mr raymond i do not wish to weary you with my feelings but the first great distrust i ever felt of my wisdom in pushing this matter so far came with that curl of mary's lip more plainly than eleanor's words it showed me the temper with which she was entering upon this undertaking and struck with a momentary dismay i advanced to speak when mary stopped me there now mamma hubbard don't you go and acknowledge that you are frightened for i won't hear it i have promised to marry henry clavering to-day and i am going to keep my word if i don't love him she added with bitter emphasis then smiling upon me in a way which caused me to forget everything save the fact that she was going to her bridal she handed me her veil to fasten as i was doing this with very trembling fingers she said looking straight at eleanor you have shown yourself more interested in my fate than i had any reason to expect will you continue to display this concern all the way to f or may i hope for a few moments of peace in which to dream upon the step which according to you is about to hurl upon me such dreadful consequences if i go with you to f eleanor returned it is as a witness no more my sisterly duty is done very well then mary said dimpling with sudden gaiety i suppose i shall have to accept the situation mamma hubbard i am so sorry to disappoint you but the buggy won't hold three if you are good you shall be the first to congratulate me when i come home to-night and almost before i knew it the two had taken their seats in the buggy that was waiting at the door good-bye cried mary waving her hand from the back wish me much joy of my ride i tried to do so but the words wouldn't come i could only wave my hand in response and rush sobbing into the house of that day and its long hours of alternate remorse and anxiety i cannot trust myself to speak let me come at once to the time when seated alone in my lamp-lighted room i waited and watched for the token of their return which mary had promised me it came in the shape of mary herself who wrapped in a long cloak and with her beautiful face aglow with blushes came stealing into the house just as i was beginning to despair a strain of wild music from the hotel porch where they were having a dance entered with her producing such a weird effect upon my fancy that i was not at all surprised when in flinging off her cloak she displayed garments of bridal white and a head crowned with snowy roses oh mary i cried bursting into tears you are then mrs henry clavering at your service i'm a bride auntie without a bridal i murmured taking her passionately into my embrace she was not insensible to my emotion nestling close to me she gave herself up for one wild moment to a genuine burst of tears saying between her sobs all manner of tender things telling me how she loved me and how i was the only one in all the world to whom she dared come on this her wedding night for comfort or congratulation and how frightened she felt now it was all over as if with her name she had parted with something of inestimable value and does not the thought of having made some one the proudest of men solace you i asked more than dismayed at this failure of mine to make these lovers happy 
"'I don't know,' she sobbed. "'What satisfaction can it be for him to feel himself tied for life to a girl who, sooner than lose a prospective fortune, subjected him to such a parting?' "'Tell me about it,' said I. But she was not in the mood at that moment. The excitement of the day had been too much for her. A thousand fears seemed to beset her mind. Crouching down on the stool at my feet, she sat with her hands folded, and a glare on her face that lent an aspect of strange unreality to her brilliant attire. How shall I keep it secret? The thought haunts me every moment. How can I keep it secret? Why, is there any danger of its being known? I inquired. Were you seen or followed? No, she murmured. It all went off well, but where is the danger, then? I cannot say, but some deeds are like ghosts. They will not be laid. They reappear, they gibber, they make themselves known whether we will or not. I did not think of this before. I was mad, reckless, what you will. But ever since the night has come I have felt it crushing upon me like a pall that smothers life and youth and love out of my heart. While the sunlight remained I could endure it, but now, oh, auntie, I have done something that will keep me in constant fear. I have allied myself to a living apprehension. I have destroyed my happiness. I was too aghast to speak. For two hours I have played at being gay. Dressed in my bridal white and crowned with roses, I have greeted my friends as if they were wedding guests, and made believe to myself that all the compliments bestowed upon me, and they were only too numerous, were just so many congratulations upon my marriage. But it was no use. Eleanor knew it was no use. She has gone to her room to pray, while I, I have come here for the first time, perhaps for the last, to fall at someone's feet and cry, God have mercy upon me. I looked at her in uncontrollable emotion. Oh, Mary, have I only succeeded then in making you miserable? She did not answer. She was engaged in picking up the crown of roses which had fallen from her hair to the floor. If I had not been taught to love money so, she said at length, if, like Eleanor, I could look upon the splendour which has been ours from childhood as a mere accessory of life, easy to be dropped at the call of duty or affection, if prestige, adulation, and elegant belongings were not so much to me, or love, friendship, and domestic happiness more, if only I could walk a step without dragging the chain of a thousand luxurious longings after me, Eleanor can imperious as she often is in her beautiful womanhood, haughty as she can be when the delicate quick of her personality is touched too rudely, I have known her to sit by the hour in a low, chilly, ill-lighted and ill-smelling garret, cradling a dirty child on her knee and feeding with her own hand an impatient old woman whom no one else would consent to touch. Oh, oh, they talk about repentance and a change of heart if some one or something would only change mine. But there's no hope of that, no hope of my ever being anything else than what I am, a selfish, willful, mercenary girl. Nor was this mood a mere transitory one. That same night she made a discovery which increased her apprehension almost to terror. This was nothing less than the fact that Eleanor had been keeping a diary of the last few weeks, Oh, she cried in relating this to me the next day, what security shall I ever feel as long as this diary of hers remains to confront me every time I go into her room, and she will not consent to destroy it, though I have done my best to show her that it is a betrayal of the trust I reposed in her. She says it is all she has to show in the way of defence if uncle should ever accuse her of treachery to him and his happiness. She promises to keep it locked up, but what good will that do? A thousand accidents might happen, any of them sufficient to throw it into uncle's hands. I shall never feel safe for a moment while it exists. I endeavoured to calm her by saying that if Eleanor was without malice, such fears were groundless, but she would not be comforted, and seeing her so wrought up, I suggested that Eleanor should be asked 
to trust it into my keeping till such time as she should feel the necessity of using it the idea struck mary favourably oh yes she cried and i will put my certificate with it and so get rid of all my care at once and before the afternoon was over she had seen eleanor and made her request it was acceded to with this proviso that i was neither to destroy nor give up all or any of the papers except upon their united demand a small tin box was accordingly procured into which were put all the proofs of mary's marriage then existing viz the certificate mr clavering's letters and such leaves from eleanor's diary as referred to this matter it was then handed over to me with a stipulation i have already mentioned and i stowed it away in a certain closet upstairs where it has lain undisturbed till last night here mrs belden paused and blushing painfully raised her eyes to mine with a look in which anxiety and entreaty were curiously blended i don't know what you will say she began but led away by my fears i took that box out of its hiding-place last evening and notwithstanding your advice carried it from the house and it is now in my possession i quietly finished i don't think i ever saw her look more astounded not even when i told her of hannah's death impossible she exclaimed i left it last night in the old barn that was burned down i merely meant to hide it for the present and could think of no better place in my hurry for the barn is said to be haunted a man hung himself there once and no one ever goes there i you, you cannot have it she cried unless unless i found it and brought it away before the barn was destroyed i suggested her face flushed deeper then you followed me yes said i then as i felt my own countenance redden hasten to add we have been playing strange and unaccustomed parts you and i some time when all these dreadful events shall be a mere dream of the past we will ask each other's pardon but never mind all this now the box is safe and i am anxious to hear the rest of your story this seemed to compose her and after a minute she continued mary seemed more like herself after this and though on account of mr leavenworth's return and their subsequent preparations for departure i saw but little more of her what i did see was enough to make me fear that with the locking up of the proofs of her marriage she was indulging in the idea that the marriage itself had become void but i may have wronged her in this the story of those few weeks is almost finished on the eve of the day before she left mary came to my house to bid me good-bye she had a present in her hand the value of which i will not state as i did not take it though she coaxed me with all her prettiest wiles but she said something that night that i have never been able to forget it was this i had been speaking of my hope that before two months had elapsed she would find herself in a position to send for mr clavering and that when that day came i should wish to be advised of it when she suddenly interrupted me by saying uncle will never be won upon as you call it while he lives if i was convinced of it before i am sure of it now nothing but his death will ever make it possible for me to send for mr clavering then seeing me look aghast at the long period of separation which this seemed to betoken blushed a little and whispered the prospect looks somewhat dubious doesn't it but if mr clavering loves me he can wait but said i your uncle is only little past the prime of life and appears to be in robust health it will be years of waiting mary i don't know she muttered i think not uncle is not as strong as he looks and she did not say any more horrified perhaps at the turn the conversation was taking but there was an expression on her countenance that set me thinking at the time and has kept me thinking ever since not that any actual dread of such an occurrence as has happened came to oppress my solitude during the long months which now intervened i was as yet too much under the spell of her charm to allow anything calculated to throw a shadow over her image to remain long in my thoughts but when some time in the fall a letter came to me personally from mr clavering filled with a vivid appeal to tell him something of the woman who in spite of her vows 
dooms him to a suspense so cruel, and when on the evening of the same day a friend of mine who had just returned from New York spoke of meeting Mary Leavenworth at some gathering, surrounded by manifest admirers, I began to realise the alarming features of the affair, and sitting down I wrote her a letter. Not in the strain in which I had been accustomed to talk to her, I had not her pleading eyes and trembling, caressing hands ever before me to beguile my judgment from its proper exercise, but honestly and earnestly, telling her how Mr. Clavering felt, and what a risk she ran in keeping so ardent a lover from his rights. The reply she sent rather startled me. "'I have put Mr. Robbins out of my calculations for the present, and advise you to do the same. As for the gentleman himself, I have told him that when I could receive him, I would be careful to notify him. That day has not yet come. But do not let him be discouraged, she added in a postscript. When he does receive his happiness, it will be a satisfying one. When, I thought, ah, it is that when which is likely to ruin all. But intent only upon fulfilling her will, I sat down and wrote a letter to Mr. Clavering, in which I stated what she had said, and begged him to have patience, adding that I would surely let him know if any change took place in Mary or her circumstances, and having dispatched it to his address in London, awaited the development of events. They were not slow in transpiring. In two weeks I heard of the sudden death of Mr. Stebbins, the minister who had married them, and while yet labouring under the agitation produced by this shock, was further startled by seeing in a New York paper the name of Mr. Clavering among the list of arrivals at the Hoffman House, showing that my letter to him had failed in its intended effect, and that the patience Mary had calculated upon so blindly was verging to its end. I was consequently far from being surprised when, in a couple of weeks or so afterwards, a letter came from him to my address which, owing to the careless omission of the private mark upon the envelope, I opened, and read enough to learn, that, driven to desperation by the constant failures which he had experienced in all his endeavours to gain access to her in public or private, a failure which he was not backward in ascribing to her indisposition to see him, he had made up his mind to risk everything, even her displeasure, and by making an appeal to her uncle, end the suspense under which he was labouring, definitely and at once. "'I want you,' he wrote, "'dowered or dowerless. It makes little difference to me. If you will not come of yourself, then I must follow the example of the brave knights, my ancestors, storm the castle that holds you, and carry you off by force of arms.' Neither can I say I was much surprised, knowing Mary as I did, when, in a few days from this, she forwarded to me for copying this reply, If Mr. Robbins ever expects to be happy with Amy Belden, let him reconsider the determination of which he speaks. Not only would he by such an action succeed in destroying the happiness of her he professes to love, but run the greater risk of effectually annulling the affection which makes the tie between them endurable. To this there was neither date nor signature. It was the cry of warning which a spirited, self-contained creature gives when brought to bay. It made even me recoil, though I had known from the first that her pretty willfulness was but the tossing foam floating above the soundless depths of cold resolve and most deliberate purpose. What its real effect was upon him, and her fate, I can only conjecture. All I know is that in two weeks thereafter, Mr. Leavenworth was found murdered in his room, and Hannah Chester, coming direct to my door from the scene of the violence, begged me to take her in and secrete her from public inquiry, as I loved and desired to serve Mary Leavenworth. All right, so we are getting much closer to an end, right? Because, okay, first off, Q lost the paper? Q. Oh, Q said like Newman. And then the mean tricks on Miss Belden, more of them. But her story, okay, there were a lot of things that threw me. I mean, before last week, there was the the box in the barn and all that stuff in the fire, which kind of seemed like 
ain't no thing. I mean, it didn't it didn't feel like it was a red herring or a MacGuffin or anything ridiculous that Anna Catherine Green did. It was just like, oh, so there was a fire. Okay. I feel like this week's chapters validated it, that it gave Amy Belden an opportunity to think, oh, well, thank goodness that's over. And it wasn't my fault. I didn't have to decide anything. And then in this week's chapter, we find out, well, actually, hmm. However, there were several things in this chapter that kind of blew my mind. One was Mary, at some point in the story that Miss Belden is talking through, Mary sits at her feet. Mary is a very odd character to me. She doesn't fit any of the ingenues that we've covered in Craftlet before. I don't think I've been kind of going through my head thinking, well, maybe, no, not really. If you can think of someone who she she rings that bell for you, please share that. Email heather at craftlit.com or call 206-350-1642 and share your thoughts. Mary is an interesting character. But the thing that I thought was the most important was this week we found out at least one point of, yes, that's valid, animosity between Eleanor and Mary is it was Eleanor who told their uncle about Mary and Clavering. Aha! So now their relationship's tension makes quite a bit more sense to me. I thought, oh, yeah, I would be ticked off too. So there was that. We still don't know why Hannah ran, and we still don't know why Hannah was killed. So that's at least one big question mark that is left hanging for us as we move towards the, the end of the book. But we're not there yet. So there you go. That's it. I hope if you are in the United States or an expat abroad who found a turkey somewhere, I hope you are having a lovely, long Thanksgiving weekend. I hope you are well and safe and stay well and safe. And we'll talk to you later. Take care, get a vaccination, wear a mask, help other people get vaccinations and masks, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlet. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.